Kuma the tyrant. Kuma the pirate. Kuma the revolutionary. Kuma the pacifist. Kuma the father. The world government has Bartholomew Kuma in their sights. The wanted man being officially given a bounty. His buccaneer blood making him an absolute terror. A one-man army foiling the navy's plans. But in a cruel stroke of fate, he is now in their grasp. Hello, my name is This is Joy Girl. And I'm gonna make him an offer that he can't refuse. Well, unfortunately, in Kuma's case, the circumstances meant that he wasn't going to refuse any offer, no matter the consequences. And while chapter 1099 was a relatively less heavy, less tragic chapter compared to the recent heart thrashing that Oda has been serving us, you just know this is a setup for more heartbreaks to come. Because this chapter finally confirmed the deal between Kuma and Vegapunk that would allow for Bonnie to be cured, but it also confirmed a lot of things. In fact, this chapter should be titled Everything Everywhere All Connected, because throughout the course of chapter 1099, we witness a lot of details that provide more background, more information about practically every detail that we knew about or in relation to Kuma. Moments that make you go, ah. And we'll get to all of those. But first, please subscribe to the channel. I want to reach a subscriber count higher than Kuma's bounty. But how is that possible when it wasn't revealed? Well, that's the beauty. We'll just have to keep going higher and higher to make sure we beat it. And now that you've subscribed, let's talk about this deal. So far, the promise between Vegapunk and Kuma aren't to do with him becoming a Shichibukai, nor him becoming a cyborg. The simple deal is that Vegapunk will cure Bonnie, and in exchange, Kuma will become the blood source of the pacifistas, which is also a name that they decide on because Kuma describes himself as a pacifist. And there is just so much to unpack in all of this. Firstly, the name of that navy cyborg was always a source of intrigue for me, precisely because of its irony. And now we find out why. Like I said, an aha moment. And while this also adds to the duality of Kuma, the brutal warrior who is only a timid pacifist at heart, this conversation between Vegapunk and Kuma just struck me as very naive, perhaps even willfully so. By this point, both Vegapunk and Kuma knows what it means to be affiliated with the world government. Kuma has actively opposed the world government on numerous occasions, and Vegapunk even says that Dragon would kill him if he knew that he was making this deal, suggesting that Vegapunk knows on some level that what he's doing is wrong. So the fact that both of them are being hopeful that these clones will be used for peace and to save innocent people feels a little, well, as the kids say it, a little delulu. It strikes quite close to home and says a lot about our real world, particularly the debates about using technology for defensive purposes. Because wrap it up however you want, a machine that can be used for defense can easily be used as an offensive weapon. And when Vegapunk was explaining his hopes for the cyborgs, their laser beams, their indestructible body, that's exactly what I was thinking. In my head, I'm going, that's a weapon. But that's what makes this scene so tragically poignant. Because the way that I interpret it, that exchange is really both of their ways of coping. Both these men are pacifists in nature who have good intentions at heart. But they also have dreams and loves and passions that they hold so dear that they have to bend their ideals and their integrity in certain points. For Vegapunk, it's his yearning for scientific knowledge and advancements in hopes that one day it could lead to true global peace. He sees his involvement with the world government as merely a means to an end. Whereas for Kuma, it's his overwhelming love for Bonnie. And the fact that he has sacrificed so much already to save everyone else means that this time he will sacrifice everything to save her. Throughout the chapter, we see him as the warrior, the tyrant, the king, the pirate. But ultimately, Kuma's just the father. And as per his own words, he's willing to do anything to save her. So far, Kuma has been this incredibly pure and he heroic figure. But in this chapter, or in this section at least, he feels very much like a man, so much more relatable. And so perhaps hearing that it will be his body, his appearance that is the physical blueprint for the pacifistas, therefore becoming the figurehead of a creation intended for peace, maybe this was easier for him to accept than facing the reality of what the cyborgs would be used for under the world government's control. Because in his mind, this is the closest that he'll get to Sun God Nika. Which is really tragic because the more we see of Kuma's dialogue, it seems as if he's never recognized how many lives he's already saved. And what made this scene land even harder is the fact that it came right after Kuma's exchange with Dragon. The last thing that Kuma says to his former comrade is that once Bonnie is cured, he'd join the revolutionaries again. But we now know, witnessing Saturn's diabolical planning, that this will probably never happen. Dragon the revolutionary steered his comrade, his friend, down a path that gave the world government perhaps 
perhaps the greatest naval advantage by that point. And this interaction also felt so poignant because I interpret Dragon's behavior to have multiple layers. First of all, it's very choice language used in that dialogue, the winds of fate. Not only does this add further fuel to his wind devil fruit speculations, but on first glance, these words seem to be quite juxtaposed to his character. As the leader of the revolutionaries, which is a very principled, very organized group, relying on the carefree winds of fate seems to be very counterposed to his character. But I think this goes to show how inherent the D blood is. Dragon is still ultimately part of the D clan, and he understands the importance of following where your heart wants to go, and that in turn, fate will carry you on your journey as well. And that's important because I think for Dragon, he lets Kuma go, despite his top officers in Aiva and Inazuma being captured, despite Kuma literally being a one-man army, someone that he could really use in his organization. But he wants Kuma to be free, and a large part of Kuma being free means saving Bonnie. And so maybe this is also Dragon's way of making up for the fact that Ginny was also his comrade, and he wasn't able to do anything to save her. It's clear that Ginny also meant a lot to Dragon, hence why he wouldn't give Bello Betty or anyone her former post. And also, maybe, just maybe, Dragon is trying to live vicariously through Kuma, because Kuma's making the choice that Dragon didn't. Kuma is choosing his child over the rest of the world, whereas Dragon left Luffy, and he chose the greater good. And I'm sure Dragon feels a slight pang of, if not regret, at least apologetic towards his child, and maybe himself that he's deprived both of them the love and happiness of a father-child relationship, and so he wants at least Kuma to enjoy that. In any case, I thought having these scenes one right after another fits beautifully, and adds another sense of tragedy that Kuma wouldn't get to experience his dreams of becoming a revolutionary again. For a while, we've all been hoping that once we get back to the present timeline, Kuma will also reach Egghead, and that he'll get to witness Sun God Nika, that before his ultimate death, he would attain some peace knowing that he was instrumental in his idol's journey. But now on top of this, after this chapter, I also want Dragon to come to Egghead, and I would just love it if he and Kuma could fight again side by side for one more time, one last time, saving Vegapunk, Bonnie, and Luffy, fulfilling Kuma's dream to meet the legendary deity, but also his dream to one day go back and fight alongside the man that he so greatly admired. And I may be asking for too much here, but it does at least seem like Kuma's showdown against Saturn is incoming. Because at the end of the chapter, as we see Saturn concocting evil plans on how to use the pacifista, I'm sure this will lead to Kuma working for the world government as one of the warlords himself, and ultimately his cyborgification. Which is a clever piece of foreshadowing when Kuma misunderstands Vegapunk, questioning whether his cure for Bonnie will turn her into a cyborg, which I have to say is also pretty funny because that was a very popular fan theory since the last chapter. But of course, in a cruel twist of irony, it's Kuma who becomes cyborgified. Interestingly, Saturn has had pretty heavy involvement in Kuma's story, appearing not only at the end of this chapter, but also seen reacting to the news of Sorbet Kingdom's new ruler. And now, as we approach the climax, I suspect that we'll see an extension of their initial interaction back at God Valley, including how Kuma managed to get away from Saturn, which will most likely involve him using his then newly acquired ability, teleporting using the powers of the purple fruit. And I have to say that Saint J. Garcia Saturn, being the primary antagonist for Kuma's story, fits very well, especially after the dialogue between Vegapunk and Kuma in this chapter, with Vegapunk referring to Kuma as a saint, which is ironically a title held by Saturn. A twisted irony that Saturn, and well really, this goes for all the Gorosei, that they are the ones referred to as saints, while their actions are those of oppression and aggression, the exact opposite of sainthood, the opposite of saints like Kuma being the best example of someone willing to do anything, including trading his own freedom and safety and protection for the person he cares about the most. And this is a nice contrast to the dark theme of the Gorosei whose aim is to suppress the people's freedom. The biggest example of this being their hiding of the truth from the rest of the world. A question I did get from Saturn's scene was, how long has the world government been wired tapping Vegapunk, and when did they stop? Because this flashback was a number of years ago, and we know they recently found out about Vegapunk's research into the Void Century via York, not via other means, and we didn't see them listening in to the conversation between Shaka and Dragon. Does this mean that Vegapunk figured out that he was being eavesdropped on at some point, 
and have they been playing a cat and mouse game ever since? Maybe wiretapping was also only possible because of the lack of security around Vegapunk at that point. Which in another ah moment, Oda suggests that this is following Caesar Clown's poison gas explosion at Punk Hazard. Another question is whether the brief dialogue about the Buccaneer blood being special will go anywhere, or be relevant and important to the story later on. We already know that physically this race is stronger, but does it relate to an even deeper mystery? Something that will go to the lore of One Piece? Also, when Vegapunk says that he's been looking for the perfect candidate to base his cyborgs on, perhaps this is why Kaido the Oni and King the Lunarian were also captured. Maybe their lineage factors could have been Vegapunk's plans for the super genes to base the government cyborgs off. But speculations aside, something that I loved in the scene between Vegapunk and Kuma were those panels of Bonnie and Sentomaru. They were just so cute playing together in the background. I mentioned in a recent video of mine that it seemed like Sentomaru was particularly keen to save Bonnie's life, and now we know that it's personal. Speaking of personal, Kuma having a personal history with the islands that he chose to send the Straw Hats to is a very nice touch. Another ah moment. I think we all suspected this anyways given how apt each location was for the Straw Hats, but seeing it confirmed on paper and witnessing Kuma's backstory in general really makes you appreciate his role in the Straw Hats journey overall. It's also one of those moments I wouldn't mind if the anime extended these series of panels and added in some filler of Kuma's own adventure during his travels. Like when he got to Kuragaino for example. Was it already deserted? Did he try and seek help from the human drills? Did they try to copy his devil fruit ability? A more significant a heart moment is that we finally got the background as to why Kuma's epithet is Kuma the Tyrant and as many of us suspected he wasn't really the Tyrant King of Sorbet Kingdom and this title was just the result of a fabricated story. And I'm of two minds about this. On one hand, I'm glad the Sorbet Kingdom knew the truth and everyone who actually knew Kuma recognized him for the gentle soul that he was. Especially after the last couple of chapters, I'm not sure my heart could have taken much more of a beating, like if we had some misunderstanding on the scale of King Riku at Dressrosa. But at the same time, this was the most straightforward and non-dramatic explanation, so I did find it slightly underwhelming. But I think that's what happens when you devise elaborate head cannons and backstories in your head. And I have to say that the surrounding backstory of Kuma means that this simple misunderstanding does add a lot to his character as this sweet and pure soul whom to the rest of the world is a cold and burly killing machine. Because I also imagine that as we witness him becoming a Shichibukai, he may just very well live up to his tyrant nickname. Besides, there was still plenty of tragedy when you read between the lines. For me, the fact that the tragedy and damage that resulted from the burning of the Goa Kingdom extended beyond the borders of the small East Blue Island and affected other citizens and faraway lands because it was the source of inspiration for the likes of King Bikori to do the same in Sorbet Kingdom makes that incident so much more horrific. It makes you wonder how many other cruel kings had the same idea and how many more innocent civilians suffered as a result. This also adds to the it's all connected theme because this is an incident that we knew from all the way back in the Marineford arc and it's also an incident that is very important to central characters including Dragon and Sabo who also have personal relationships with Kuma. Similar to what I said about Saturn, as the secondary antagonist to Kuma's story, King Bekori is a great contrast to Kuma. Someone who unlike Kuma is physically weak but is willing to do evil deeds and thinks it's necessary to be evil to attain happiness, while Kuma is blessed with strong physical attributes whose actions to create a free world are driven by his pure heart. It's such a classic comic book trope that I think works really well for Kuma's story. I find it particularly meaningful that King Bikori uses his army to kill innocent civilians, avoiding direct or literal blood on his hands, whereas Kuma, who chooses to protect people, ends up with blood on his hands, such as in this chapter, with Bekori ordering his guards to shoot a handful of people and Kuma then raging on them. We also find out how Bonnie acquired her Toshi Toshi no Mi, which was via accident to the point that she didn't even realize she ate it until she and others realized its effects. Which, if you ask me, is a pretty damn near identical reflection of what happened to Luffy and his devil fruit. What did I tell you about this all being connected? We even see Bonnie teaching herself how to use her ability 
activities like we witnessed for Luffy, and both of them declaring that they want to set out to sea, and although it's for slightly different reasons, both of them are motivated by their desire for freedom. Luffy, the freedom of adventure, whereas Bonnie thinks she'll finally be free to step out into the real world. And if this doesn't scream straw hat material, then I don't know what does, but we have been wrong before. This parallel with Luffy is about one of the only things that saves me from feeling quite dissatisfied about how Bonnie got her devil fruit because we don't even know what it was doing there in the first place and it just felt very convenient. But the nature of the devil fruit itself is very apt for Bonnie's character and causes a lot of different emotions. I felt it pull my heartstrings when Bonnie used the fruit to be 10 years old so that she can finally travel the world with Kuma as per their promise while Kuma understands the sad truth of what this really means. For a chapter that isn't as sad as say 1098, seeing the small panel of Kuma crying when he's close to giving up on a cure is such a small detail but so so sad. And there's a great sense of bittersweet in the knowledge that for Kuma, perhaps in some quiet moments as he reflects on Bonnie's devil fruit, maybe he would think to himself, at least I got to see Bonnie reach the age of 11, her 20s and even older, even if it is artificial and the result of her devil fruit and not because she's actually survived her disease. But the fruit also resulted in some comical moments as well which I did appreciate, perhaps the funniest one being the fact that she looks like Nami, but in all seriousness, moments like Kuma holding up Connie, the Dowager Queen being constantly mistaken for Bonnie did make me chuckle. And here we get another explanation, another ah, so that's what happened, because Bonnie just happens to look like Connie when she ages herself up to that age, which could again be argued to be somewhat underwhelming or convenient, especially because this means Connie isn't actually blood related to Bonnie as many had suspected, since Bonnie used this disguise at the reverie. First of all, the names sound very familiar with only one letter difference, and when Bonnie was disguised as Connie, she did really look like an aged up Bonnie. But I do have to hand it for Oda for throwing around these red herrings and being able to thwart all sorts of crazy speculations that we've had. It also makes sense that because Sorbe Kingdom is a relatively small and poor kingdom, people didn't catch the difference between Bonnie and Connie at the reverie and that's how she got away with it. I do wonder whether Connie and King Bulldog were also present during the reverie, because does that mean they also witnessed Kuma's horrific state? The good news is that if people were recognizing Bonnie as the Dowager Queen, that means that Bulldog must still be in throne, so King Bekori is gone for good hopefully, and he didn't try yet another attempt to retake power. I mean, how many thrashings does one take before they finally learn? And because no chapter would be complete without switching my head into overthinking speculation mode, something that struck me about Bonnie was her fighting prowess. The fact that Bonnie is very physically capable has me thinking more deeply about her heritage. By this point, I have come to the opinion that we don't need to find out who Bonnie's biological father is, but then Oda includes a detail like this and it sends me spiraling. And while it's not necessary, revealing Bonnie's lineage may be important because it could be a significant key to what happens to her after this arc, or to be more specific, after this whole ordeal that she's involved with finishes, because I think her relevance to the story will extend beyond this Egghead Island arc, similar to Law's involvement with the Straw Hats lasting multiple arcs. Because if we think about the current situation, Bonnie is still a child, and at the end of this all, she will need to be taken in the care of someone. Now you could say that she could return to the life of piracy, but now that we know her real age and the circumstances around her character, you could argue that maybe she was only able to survive in the pirate world against stronger foes without having any notable powerful crew members because she is by blood a celestial dragon or related to a Shichibukai. And I'm just gonna assume an entirely baseless scenario that it was part of Kuma's deal with the world government to allow Bonnie to travel the world as per her dreams, but that they would act as an umbrella of safety for Bonnie wherever she goes. Maybe even her bounty wasn't because she committed any heinous pirate activities, but more because the government placed it on her head because she was a celestial dragon. Imagine if it's similar to the Sanji situation where Bonnie's unseen bounty poster has only the word alive on it. Maybe that's what Sakazuki meant about her getting away from the marines because she made it hard for them to keep track and protect her. The bounty being a way to make sure that she would come again under their care. Anyways, going back to what happens to Bonnie after everything is resolved, unlike Momonosuke and the scabbards who have a country that they can stay in and all the other people that the Straw Hats have saved in the past, Bonnie has no clear place to go. The closest companion we know she has is Vegapunk, who is currently being hunted by the world government, and Egghead Island is unlikely 
likely to be safe. And so another of course is that she joins the Straw Hat Pirates in their journey and she becomes a fitting crew member being a follower of the Sun God Nika, which is something that I'm sure Kuma would approve of, but what if she doesn't end up joining the crew? What other choice would she have? Now imagine this scenario if Moni is a celestial dragon from a well-known family and coincidentally that family's assumedly figurehead also just happened to be introduced in the same arc. And yes, by that, I am talking about Garling Figureland. Because normally, a standard Celestial Dragon is physically weak, but what if Bonnie is the daughter of Garling Figureland, making her the daughter of a God's Knight? And not just any God's Knight, but its Supreme Commander. It would kind of make sense, right? First off, let's get the most obvious feature out of the way, and that's the hair, because Bonnie's hair is pink, whereas Garling's is red. But this could be easily resolved. Based on the comments about Bonnie made in this chapter, she looks very much like Ginny, suggesting that they may even share the same hair color, which isn't confirmed, but in either case, from the shading, we know that Ginny's hair is light. So that mixed with Garling's vibrant red could produce the pink hue of Bonnie's hair. And aesthetics aside, and more importantly, I think the fact that Bonnie is a proven good fighter for her young age, despite not being shown to have anyone to have trained her, sparks the idea that perhaps Bonnie's physical prowess is owed to her lineage, being the daughter of a fighting celestial dragon. And I know some of you will argue that Kuma most likely trained her, and maybe he did, but did he really? Because there's not a single panel of Kuma training Bonnie to be a fighter in their flashbacks, and all the moments they've shared together a wholesome bonding time. Also, Kuma was gone for a while, searching for her cure, being a pirate, and that was really when we saw Bonnie train in combat. Also, just personally, I don't think fighting is what Kuma intended for Bonnie. So imagine then, if Bonnie does travel with the Straw Hats, and if Elbaf is in fact the next island that we go to next, Bonnie would now be in the land of her family as Elbaf falls part of Shanks' territory. So imagine if Bonnie even stays behind at Elbaf instead, and she doesn't join the Straw Hats, this would be a very impactful, we've come full circle journey. Because it would mean that Bonnie, the abandoned child of the Figurelands, is now protected by his descendant. And look, if we've gotten to this point this deep in the speculations, that's a clear sign that we should wrap it up. So thank you all for listening to another one of my ramblings. Make sure to subscribe, make sure to like, leave a comment below, and thank you to our Patreon and channel members for all of your support. This is Joy Girl, and I'll see you again soon. Yeah. Mm -hmm.